Hi guys and thanks for joining me for another episode of my transition diaries. Um, as for my transition, it's going well, appetite is still good and I'm pretty sure that's the estrogens, but I've not noticed any other differences. My week has been a mixed bag. Um, Sunday, met a pal for coffee in the morning, met another pal for brunch, at lunch, well, about midday, and then I met my ex for donuts um, in the afternoon, and that didn't go terribly well. So, um, it's a bit of a sore point for me. I'm not sure when, when I'm going to be able to see my daughter. Um, I hope soon, but um, having not seen her since since July now, um, I'm pretty desperate at this stage, and I I don't know really where I stand with that. Um, but I don't want to dwell on that too much because it's far too depressing. Um, Monday was good. Um, met. Pal Christine for lunch and got my lovely bracelet from Lauren and thanks again. Um, I feel unashamed and I wear it with pride as I did um, on Monday evening and Tuesday evening. Monday evening met a pal, a couple of pals for dinner, um, Mexican food which was lovely and Tuesday I was supposed to be on a date, but my date didn't turn up. And again, massive thanks to Christine for getting changed out of your pyjamas and coming to join me at the Gannet, and the food and drinks were lovely as usual. <laughs> um, the rest of the week's been a wee bit boring, um, not much going on, mood's been up and down, and I'm not afraid to admit that I had thoughts of self-harm for the first time in a while, although nothing that I acted on. Um, and I'm feeling a wee bit better today, and more sanguine about things. Um, as for what I've got planned for the rest of the day today, and for the rest of the weekend, nothing really. Um, don't know that I'm feeling up to going out, and certainly not up to getting dressed up for Halloween, at least not this year, but fingers crossed with that for <laughs> next year, but we'll see how we go. Um, as for what I want to talk about this week, it's going to be mainly focusing on beauty and beauty standards. Now, for those of you who are expecting tutorials, I'm sorry to leave you disappointed. Um, I hope you know me well enough by now to know that that won't really be the focus of of my talk. Um, but what I want to start off with here is taking you through um, my beauty regime and showing you my face without makeup, which is um, a big step for me. So, um, yeah. So this is sped up 15 times here. I'm applying primer first, then concealer. Uh, and blending my concealer by hand, and then foundation, blending with a kabuki brush, and some more foundation, <laughs> and some more foundation, <laughs> and blend and blend, and eyebrows next, so eyebrow primer and then eyebrow gel, and for those of you who are bothered, this is the Benefit Cabral stuff that I keep on ranting about, and it is good. Um, I do like it. And then Brow Setting Gel next. And then we go for eyeshadow, and this is the Urban Decay Full Spectrum Palette, and you can see, even in 15 times sped up, how long this is taking me here. <laughs> So I've gone for a wee yellow to orange blend um, with some gold to the brow bone here. And obviously blending, blending, blending. <laughs> 
So after this we've got my eyeliner, and I love a good eyeliner, and I use the Illamasqua uh, Precision Gel in the Infinity shade with a wee fine brush. And for those of you who wanted to know, that's how I manage to get my perfect wings every time, but it does take a while. <laughs> um, it's not something that's easy to do, and yeah. I've been perfecting this for years, so mascara, fairly straightforward. If I hadn't had my OVLs done, I'd be using curlers, highlighter to all of the high points in my face, and again, that's Illamasqua Beyond Powder, and contour. This is the Rihanna Fenty contour, and it's the Fenty foundation that I'm using as well. And contouring my nose and my cupid's bow as well. And some blusher just underneath my cheekbones. And blend with a beauty blender. And some more blending. And all over some finishing powder and some setting spray and some lipstick. And that's me done. And just to illustrate the point there, um, these are all of the products that I've used on my face today. Um, obviously used all the products on my body and obviously used tons of applicators and brushes, so neoliberal economics in action for you. Now, the reason I chose this topic really is because people have been coming up to me and congratulating me on being beautiful and like, okay, so I'm being congratulated for being beautiful, but being beautiful, is that something that I'm aspiring to be? No. Is that something I should be aspiring to be? Not really. Is that something transgender people should aspire to be? No. Is that something women should aspire to be? No. I don't have an issue with being perceived as beautiful. But I don't think it's something that we should be aspiring to, and I don't think it's something I'd want my daughter to be aspiring to. Well, you could ask yourself, well, how does my philosophy here fit in with beauty and makeup and fashion and feminism? I consider myself to be a feminist. Does that mean that I can't enjoy makeup and beauty? No. But, yeah, it does, it does make me feel uneasy when people congratulate me. If I was less conventionally good-looking, then would that make my transition experience any less valid? No, it wouldn't, because it's about my personal journey. It's not about being perceived as or looking beautiful. I don't know if that makes any sense or if I'm just rambling here. And then you've got to ask yourself, well, what are our beauty standards? Are we being perceived as beautiful by each other, or are we being perceived as beautiful by other people. And yes, it's fair to say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but excuse me if I sound like a raving communist here, our beauty standards are perceived from the perspective of white, cisgender, heterosexual, Oxbridge Ivy League, atheist or Christian, privately schooled, men. Um, and it's this culture that forms the dominant global hegemony. Um, hegemony, sorry. Well, I'm not sure I said able-bodied and anglophone in there, but it is definitely an able-bodied and anglophone perspective now. I know not all of my friends share my um, liberal politics, but a couple of points to illustrate the perspective. Now, if you look at South Korea, it is the most ethnically homogenous society in the world, and yet the rates of plastic surgery there are very high when compared to elsewhere on the globe. And if you look at the facial surgery that's being done, it's to make people look more Caucasian or conforming to European beauty standards. And looking at all of the medical textbooks, these are the normal relationships, proportions of an ideal aesthetic face, and these are the normal Caucasian ranges. It's nothing about ethnic
ethnic minorities or any other perspectives. And when you're considering beauty from an alternative perspective, it is, that, it is just that, it's alternative beauty and it's almost fetishized. Um, so, I do think that uh, we do need to take a strong look at our beauty standards and really consider what we say when we say somebody is beautiful um, and stop focusing on the body and how it looks and how it's perceived to the bourgeoisie. Uh, <laughs> sorry for sounding like a communist again. Oh, you've got to ask yourself, well, where, where did this come from? And I'm going to maybe talk about this a bit more when I get into feminism a bit deeper. But to some extent, it's colonialism, imperialism um, that's imposing these opinions or these norms upon society, and upon, I mean upon global society, not just our society here in the UK. Um, possibly nationalism, but I don't know, maybe it's more insidious than that, maybe it's jingoism. Um, I don't know, and I'm happy to debate with anybody who sees fit. Um, I suppose that's all I've got to chat about for today. Um, I will try to get a bit deeper into feminism um, in future episodes, um, but those of you who are still listening, thank you, and goodbye for now.